Hey ghouls, it's DM Gay, your friendly neighborhood horror comedy author, and I am here with a spooky season surprise for you. Now I've been hinting that I had something special in store for October, and here it is. I have written a horror comedy short story called Bake Off. It is a granny horror comedy. Watch those grannies. All of the royalties this month, October 2022, will be donated to kidney cancer research to help future patients with stage four kidney cancer, just like me. But that's not the biggest surprise. The biggest surprise is that I talk my mom into doing the audio edition for you. So here it is. It's free and it's right here. I hope you enjoy it. Bake Off, a horror comedy short story by DM Gay. Read by VM Gay, her mom. Bake Off. Ida Mae Turnbull knew the 123rd annual Happy Hollow Charity Ladies Auxiliary Bake Off fundraiser was off to an unusual start the second she bit into Norma Burton's cherry pie. And a cherry bit her back. Goodness gracious me! Ida May pulled the fork out of her mouth and came face to face with a row of teeth. Sharp, pointy, yellow. Really, Norma, some sort of critter got mixed up in your fruit. At first, she thought it was a mouse, but it snarled a bit, looking for something to sink its teeth into. Ida May had certainly never met a mouse like that. Or a cherry, for that matter. The two white-haired women stared at the tiny, angry thing until it screeched at them and tried to jump right off the fork, aiming for Ida May's jugular. Well, I never! Ida May was not one to put up with that kind of nonsense. She speared the tiny red menace, sticking it clean through the middle pinning it to the table with one of the chapter's antique sterling silver dessert forks. It went limp. How curious. Ida May took a deep breath, <sighs> smoothed the few loose hairs back into her tight white bun, ran her hands down her lavender hound's tooth suit, and decided to carry on. She was here to judge the championship round of the longest-running and most prestigious dessert-based competition and fundraiser in Shade County. She wasn't about to get ruffled by a wayward cherry. Norma just stared at the cherry in horrified silence. Norma, the texture of your crust was excellent. Flaky, light, but the filling had a little too much bite. Literally, Ida May put her white glove to her lip, and when she pulled it back, there was a spot of blood on her fingertips. Unfortunately, I have to disqualify you. I can't give a rosette ribbon to a pie that draws blood. And I couldn't possibly sell it to the public. And the public was waiting. It was a sunny Saturday afternoon in Happy Hollow, Ohio. Half the town was outside the town hall at the bake sale, lined up around the block, waiting for a winner. Ida May had to deliver because she had money to raise. The fountain in the town square needed repairs, and sure, the entries that didn't make it to the final round sold well enough, but slices of the grand champion dessert always fetched the highest price. She had to get these sweets, the ones that didn't bite, outside before the crowd dwindled. So, Ida May did what she did best, stayed calm and on schedule. She wrote disqualified next to Norma's name on her clipboard, then turned to the four remaining contestants, each standing behind their own table in a semicircle on the town hall's stage. 
Their eyes were big, wide open, and glued to Norma's unruly cherry. It's all right, Ida May decided to reassure everyone, including herself, after the event's unsettling turn. The cherry incident was an anomaly. Nothing like this has happened before, so there's very little chance it would happen again. Ida May glanced at the speared cherry, just to be sure, and breathed easier when she saw it wasn't moving. That's what you get when you use canned filling. Who knows what's in it? Probably made in China. Virginia Ford Davis whispered, pretending she didn't want Norma or anyone else to hear, but loud enough that everyone could. And in a disposable pie plate. Really, what is the world coming to? Virginia stood at table five looking like a giant Easter egg, all pink, from her hat all the way down to her satin shoes, waiting her turn to be judged. That in itself was unusual in Happy Hollow. Virginia was always the one doing the judging. Everyone, everything, everywhere, all the time, unsolicited, even when there wasn't a contest. Virginia, a word. Ida May stepped to Virginia, determined to shush her. But Virginia wasn't one to waste an ear. Poor Norma, bless her heart. I hear her mind is going. Still, you were right to disqualify her. We can't present that abomination to the public. The charity lady's auxiliary has standards to uphold. And if we falter, the whole town will follow. Happy Hollow is hanging on by a thread as it is. Virginia cleared her throat, then forced her pink lips into a wide, cheerful smile. Now, have a taste of my Boston cream pie. Family recipe... My great-grandmother brought it from New England when the family moved here to oversee the Sunny Creek Mine. Very high pedigree. Why, my great-aunt Cornelia once served it to a young President Taft. You can taste the class in every bite. Ida May rolled her eyes on the inside, but kept a cl- polite smile on the outside. She let Virginia prattle on. Ida May knew not to interrupt Virginia's tenuous claims to blue blood pedigree or her running commentary on the questionable breeding, low class, bad manners, and poor etiquette of her fellow townsfolk. If she did, Virginia would just go on about it longer. Ida May knew firsthand she had lived next door to her for 70 of her 82 years. Besides, Virginia wasn't fooling anyone. Everyone in the room knew she loved to talk about the strong, rich branches of her family tree, while conveniently pruning the underperforming ones, particularly her only son, Randall, He did not work on Wall Street and had never attended Harvard, as Virginia claimed. They all knew he worked nights at the gas station three towns over. Besides, Norma's cherry was still on Ida May's mind, and Virginia's grandstanding bought her a few minutes to think. Ida May glanced over at Norma's table and was relieved to see her pie, still behaving like a pie. But a chill ran over her. Such a puzzle. What would make a cherry act like that? She couldn't wrap her mind around it. Virginia refused to be ignored. Her smiling face rose before Ida May's eyes. She leaned in, too close, trying to angle a fork full of sponge cake into Ida May's mouth. 
Have a taste. Here's your winner. The fork was almost in when Norma screamed. A blood-curdling shriek of absolute terror. Ida May jumped, and Virginia's Boston cream landed on her cheek. What in God's name? Ida May couldn't believe what she was seeing. Norma's pie crust rippled and bucked like something was trying to punch its way out. That wayward cherry sprang to life and wrestled free of the fork, crawling across the white tablecloth, fangs bared, heading for Norma. Clara Cook, junior judge and owner of the Happy Miner Diner down by Highway 78, pushed Norma away and swatted it with a tea towel. Ida May's heart kicked up, beating faster than it had in 60 years. The other contestants went white, like fear drained all the blood out of them. Virginia crossed her arms and huffed. Goodness, have you ever seen such a thing? She probably baked in a rat. Did you check if it had a tail? Mrs. Turnbull, ah, goodness. Chester Mellon, honorary judge and mayor of Happy Hollow, aged 95, and dapper in his white linen suit, screamed, We seem to have a problem at table one. Chester stood in front of June Snow's vegan carrot cake with not cream cheese icing. A sliver of cake reached up and slapped Chester across his cheek, to everyone's surprise. Then the cake split into chunks. They rose off the plate, turning and swaying like leeches, looking for a warm body to hook into. And they found one. Chester. The chunks snapped forward and attached themselves to his face, muffling his screams. Sweet baby Jesus up in heaven! Ida May didn't usually use such strong language, but her heart pounded so hard it felt like it might punch out of her chest. Her mind raced. She didn't know what was going on here, but she had to put an end to it right now. Everyone! Stay calm and back away from the desserts. The contestants were not calm, but they did retreat. Everyone cowered, hiding behind their tables, clutching their cake servers and whisks, white-knuckled like weapons. Ida May went after Chester, but Clara made it to him first. She beat that beast of a cake right off his face, with the bronze spatula trophy that was supposed to go to the third-place finisher. When the cake let go, Chester spun out of its grip like a white-haired top. But that vegan carrot cake didn't quit. Thick orange chunks, fat like unshredded carrots, rose out of the icing. They turned and undulated, looking for another warm body. June passed out cold at the sight of them, dropping white where she stood. Chester scrambled away, out of reach, and Clara raised that bronze spatula to the frosted beast again and said, Get out of here! Go on! Get! The orange chunks smacked the table, frustrated, then sunk back into the icing. The room fell silent. The remaining chunks of June's cake lay motionless on the table. Like any self-respect cake should, even Norma's cherry pie calmed down, lying still in its foil pan. Everyone eyed each other and their desserts warily. Clara knelt down to check on June. What on God's green earth? Ida May asked. I hate to say it, but I warned you, Ida May. This organization is a pillar of wholesome American values. That cake shouldn't be allowed in this competition. 
vegan, organic, really. That's two steps down the slippery slope to communism. One past the hippies, and that's saying something. Virginia tut-tutted. This town's reputation is tarnished enough. We don't need to help it along. In trying times, we need traditional values more than ever. Everyone ignored Virginia. They all turned to Ida May, looking for answers. She didn't have any. For the first time in her life, she didn't know what to do or what she was dealing with. But she couldn't tell them that. Leaders are brave in times of crisis, she thought. Leaders keep their underlings safe. Ida May didn't feel brave. She felt rattled. She had a racing heart and a knot in her stomach. But she took a deep breath and rustled up a plan anyway. This has certainly been a strange championship round. You are welcome to withdraw your entry and leave. No one will think less of you, given the circumstances, she said. But if you choose to stay, keep a close eye on your dessert. If you see anything unusual, report it to a judge immediately. Then retreat. Safety is the highest priority. Do not approach or engage with any aggressive or unusual ingredients. Do you understand... They all nodded. All right, I'll give you a few minutes to decide. Then, unless there are any objections, we'll proceed with the judging and crown the grand champion today. I have an idea that can save us all some time. Virginia forked another slice off her Boston cream pie and lifted it to Ida May. Have a taste, dear. This is your grand champion. I don't know why we're putting on this charade. We all know my dessert is heads above all of these. It's the only entry here with any class. Why don't you officially declare me the winner now? So everyone can go home. We'll all be safe, and we can put this nastiness behind us. The other contestants looked at Virginia, not in a nice way. More than one pair of eyes turned to slits, and a few jaws dropped. If anyone had planned to leave, Virginia's self-aggrandizing declaration had changed their mind. Edna and Gloria even made it as far as the door, but decided to walk their pineapple dream cake back to their table. We'll see, Virginia, when it's your turn. Fair is fair. Ida May checked her clipboard. Norma and June disqualified. Two desserts before Virginia. Ginger at table four. But first, Chester, Clara, meet me at table three. Gloria and Edna's pineapple dream cake is next. You mean pineapple nightmare, Virginia huffed. Edna's mama pulled that recipe off a cake box in 1955 and just wouldn't let it go. They've brought that thing to every potluck down at Our Lady of Perpetual Sorrow since. Lord help us all. This town has been subjected to that cake long enough. Virginia... Please keep your comments to yourself, or I'll have to disqualify you. Ida May shot her a look, the shut-up look. Virginia did, but her tight mouth and raised eyebrows made clear it was by force, not out of any desire to be polite. As soon as Ida May turned around, Virginia whispered, supposedly to herself, Those two joined at the hip. I don't care if they are best friends. 
it's not natural. People get ideas about women who act like that. And that Gloria, always lugging around that giant purse, she's practically a bag lady. What does she even keep in there? Ida May ignored her. She stepped to Gloria and Edna, who stood behind their table, trembling, clinging to each other, eyes darting all around like they were about to take mortar fire. They were so jumpy, the flowers on their polyester dresses, same print, one in pink, one in blue, they always coordinated, looked like they were about to shake off the polyester stems. The judges cautiously reconvened over the pineapple dream cake, and it sure did look like a dream. Light, fluffy peaks of icing, dusted with perfectly toasted chunks of coconut. Pineapple rounds, topped with maraschino cherries. The scent of sugar and citrus hung in the air. Ida May said, Clara, you do the honors. Clara fished a clean fork out of her apron pocket, then hesitated. Clara looked at Chester, who looked at Gloria, who looked at Edna, who looked at Ida May, who for a split second thought she saw the cake jiggle out of the corner of her eye. Hold on a moment. She grabbed Clara's arm and stared at the cake, but it didn't act up. It sat perfectly still on its glass stand. Ida May's eyes must have played a trick on her, probably from all the excitement. She glanced back at the carrot cake and the cherry pie again as a safety check, but June was the only thing moving. She sat up and rubbed her head, looking confused about how she ended up on the floor. Okay, you can proceed. Clara mustered the nerve and stuck the fork in, slowly, not very deep, and held it there for a moment, just to be safe. Nothing happened. They all sighed, relieved. Thank goodness, Ida May said. It looks like the worst is behind us. Clara sunk the fork deeper into Gloria and Edna's cake. It moaned low, a vibration so strong it rattled Ida May's bones. For a brief moment, she was overcome by a grim feeling, like a tidal wave of unspeakable darkness had rolled out of a desolate void and crashed down over her, and then it stopped. Apparently, they all felt it because they all stood confused for a few seconds, shaking off that dark feeling, until they noticed the cake staring at them. And I sat in the center of that pineapple dream, big, round, and all red like a raging fire. It had a long yellow pupil shaped like a goat's. Edna and Gloria and Chester and Clara clung to each other like life preservers because that giant fiery eye pushed up, melting off the perfect peaks of icing, setting the toasted coconut flakes aflame on its way out. Holy name of Jesus! Ida May put her arms out to protect the others. Her bony sticks of flesh weren't much of a shield, but that didn't stop her from trying. Back away, everyone! Clara did. She grabbed Ginger, Norma, and June and corralled them to safety. But Chester didn't. He just stood there, making the sign of the cross, whimpering and shaking so hard everyone could hear his knobby knees clinking together. Thankfully, Edna and Gloria knocked him clear of the strange eye when they ran and jumped off the stage, faster than seemed possible for two chubby 70-somethings in orthotic shoes and support stockings. The duo took shelter behind a row of metal folding chairs. 
Edna grabbed one to use as a weapon, waving it like she was a lion tamer. Gloria fished a curling iron out of her giant purse and wielded it like a bullwhip. But the cake didn't follow them. It locked eyes with Ida May and wailed. The vibration was so strong, her teeth rattled, and chunks of plaster fell off the ceiling. Ida May raised her fork, ready to stab the beast. I don't know what you are or where you came from, but you aren't welcome here. Go away and never come back. The eye blinked, the cake shrugged, and the thing sunk into the icing and disappeared. It left only a large eye-shaped hole in the center of Edna and Gloria's pineapple dream. I can't believe that worked, Ida May said. It's gone. If you ask me, it's a sign, Virginia said. Nothing good ever happens when a community relaxes its standards. One weak thread, and all that's good and decent unravels. Do you want us to end up like all the other mining towns in these hills? Or do you want Happy Hollow to rise again to a fresh new dawn of prosperity? It's time to think about our future, Ida May. Old-fashioned values will save us all in the end. It's time to reward tradition. Now... Come taste my Boston cream pie. This is a dessert with history, with pedigree, with heritage. I don't know why you haven't declared me the winner already. We need to move past this travesty. Ida May whirled around. I will get to you when it is your turn, Virginia. You are table number five. Number five is the last to be judged. You of all people know the rules. Virginia pursed her lips and looked away, which steeled Ida May's resolve to finish the contest the right way, no matter what. She grabbed Clara by the arm and drug her to table four. We best wrap this up quickly, Ginger. It's your turn. Ginger O'Brien, whose hair was red as her name and whose body was curvy as the Appalachian foothills she lived in, reluctantly took her place behind table four. She clutched her cake server, white-knuckled. Her eyes were glued to her double-chocolate devil's food cake, waiting to see if something popped out. They were all waiting and wondering. Devil's food? Seemed like a bad omen. Even Ida May thought so, but she didn't say it out loud. Ginger, is there anything you want to tell us about your cake before we start? Has it been acting unusual in any way? Have you used any new brands or ingredients or strayed from the recipe? Ginger shook her head no. I'm happy to hear it. Ida May breathed a tentative sigh of relief. (sighs) She wanted to shut the event down, but Virginia had cornered her. She couldn't leave here without a fair contest. She needed a legitimate winner. Virginia crowning herself champion? Over my dead body, she thought. If she wants it, she has to earn it. So Ida May lifted a clean fork, held her breath, and sunk the tines in slowly, very slowly, into the rich, thick chocolate frosting. Clara and Ginger watched, eyes glued to that cake, holding their breath. And... Nothing happened. Ida May sighed, relieved. Goodness, your icing smells divine. And the cake? So moist, lovely texture. 
Ida Mae tried to lift a chunk out to taste it, but the fork caught on something. Ginger, I think this section is over big. Oh, oh my! The cake sucked the fork out of her hand. The silver disappeared into the brown frosting. The cake jiggled, then sploot! It spit out the fork. The fork shot through the air. All three ladies screamed and ducked out of the way. The fork hit the floor, and Ginger went after it. She moved so fast, she was an auburn blur. She shot back up, holding it in her shaking hand like a knife, ready to fight for her life. All the color had drained out of her face, and that was saying something. Her skin was white as a highway line on a good day. Ginger had good instincts because a red spike rose from the center of that double chocolate devil's food cake. The spike grew longer, and more spikes came right along behind it until there were so many shooting through the icing in all directions. The cake looked like a devil's food porcupine. Then the cake rose off Ginger's glass cake stand, lifted by a thick, leathery stump, and wagged back and forth like the tail of an excited dog. Poor Chester lay terrified on the stage, still crossing himself, kissing the little gold crucifix he'd fished out from under his collar. It was a smart move, because that waving, spiky devil's food... It was a rallying cry for monstrous desserts. Norma's pie exploded, raining fanged red cherries all over the stage. Orange tentacles, too many to count, burst from June's vegan carrot cake. One smacked her unconscious. She lay unmoving, covered in not cream cheese icing behind table one. Again, the fiery eye shrugged off Edna and Gloria's pineapple dream, and its horrific moan rattled the town hall, shaking panes of glass out of the windows. Ida May's heart kicked up. Everyone, take cover! Arm yourselves! She shuffled Claire and Ginger away from the devil's food and turned to Virginia, ready to move her out of harm's way. Virginia clutched her handbag tight to her belly and put her nose in the air like the whole affair was beneath her. Ida May scrambled to her table. Virginia, step away from your pie. It's too dangerous. See what happens when a town has too many generations of poor breeding? Virginia side-eyed Ginger, who smacked that barbed, spiky devil's food with her fork. Really? Who names a child Ginger? With a name like that, she should have entered a tart. I hear she waitresses at that sleazy bar by the racetrack. Can you imagine showing her face around here? She has no shame. That's probably a box mix. Virginia! Ida May barked. The two locked eyes. Finally, my turn, Virginia said. A proper dessert, up to the standards of the charity lady's auxiliary, unlike the rest. You know, this used to be a fine and exclusive organization. Really? Communist? Vegans? Cocktail waitresses? In my day, none of these ladies would have been granted membership. As I always say, nothing good happens when you loosen standards. Just look how our town's fortunes have fallen. And, Virginia placed a pink gloved hand next to her mouth, pretending she didn't want anyone to hear the rest. Clara Cook is a judge? Have you tasted the pies at her diner? They're unfit to serve. Lots of truckers go through there, too. Unsavory sorts. 
Virginia! Ida May had no time to waste. Whatever had come out of the desserts was hell-bent on ripping apart the town hall. Those orange chunks? They weren't carrots. They were tentacles, and they had grown long and fat. They slithered up the walls, across the ceiling, ripping down sconces and chandeliers. Ida May wasn't about to lose contestants, and Happy Hollow's one restored landmark building to some unholy menace from the depths of hell. Not today. But Virginia didn't seem to notice the terrified screams of her fellow contestants as they fought off their desserts. She lifted a fresh fork full of Boston cream pie with a polite smile, like nothing was out of the ordinary, like this was just like any other championship round in any other year of the annual baking contest. She held out her cake, nudging Ida May to take a bite. Ida May didn't. She sunk her hands into the middle of Virginia's precious dessert and ripped it apart instead. Where is it? Where are you? Horrible beast, I will kill you. She flung handfuls of sponge cake, chocolate, and cream through the air, determined to expose the evil lurking within, until Virginia's entry was reduced to a smudge on great-grandmother Ford's Waterford crystal cake stand. But it was just crumbs. No spikes, no giant eyes, no tentacles, no angry, biting cherries. Just sugar and eggs and chocolate. My Boston cream! Virginia grabbed Ida May's cream-spattered arm sunk her nails in, and tried to wrestle her hands away. Ida May looked at Virginia, her two soggy fists filled with sponge cake, and had a revelation. What did you do? Whatever do you mean? It was you. Ida May snapped across the table and grabbed her. What have you done? Why, I have never been so insulted in my entire life. You let go of me this instant. Virginia tried to wiggle away. My suit, this is custom tailored, and you've gone and rubbed chocolate all over it. How will I ever get this stain out? Virginia either didn't know or didn't care that the cherry's enormous pie had tripled in size and attached themselves to Norma's face. Or that Norma was rolling around on the floor, trying to pull them off, even though chunks of her flesh came right off with them. Or that an orange tentacle had snatched up Chester, wrapped him head to toe, and was now shaking him like a maraca. What did you do, Virginia? Ida May knew this was Virginia's fault, deep down in her gut. This is worse than the bowling tournament. Her mind flashed to the Happy Hollow Lanes Senior Bowling League Championship two years back. Virginia's team won, but only because Hazel Hedges, the star bowler on the Shady Lanes Trailer Park team, just happened to trip and hit her head on the ball return under mysterious circumstances as she walked right past Virginia's feet, which Virginia swore on her daddy's grave were innocently crossed and out of the walkway. Concussed, bleeding, and seeing double, poor Hazel threw her ball down the wrong lane, handing Virginia's team the win. I didn't have anything to do with that. Everyone knows Hazel was thirsty. She publicly drinks beer on weekdays and lives in a trailer park. 
Really? That team parading around in a double wide embroidered on the back of their shirts like they were proud? In my day, the lower classes had enough self-respect not to advertise. And you wonder why half the businesses downtown are boarded up. Virginia could protest all she wanted. But Ida May knew Virginia wanted to win more than was healthy. And she didn't care who she had to hurt to do it. Just ask Doreen Whipple. Her tea roses were sure to win the Shade County Floral Club's annual rose contest until all her bushes suddenly and mysteriously turned yellow and died two days before the competition. Two days before they were competing against Virginia's heirloom blush, Alba's. And now this... It wasn't a coincidence that Virginia had the only monster-free dessert. Make it stop before someone gets killed. For God's sake, the cherries are eating Norma. I don't know what you're talking about. Virginia huffed and turned her back to Ginger and Clara, who had flipped the judging tables on their sides and were hiding behind them, brandishing dessert forks as weapons. The nerve of you, accusing me? Why don't you blame the loose moral values and lazy entitled youth who brought all the misfortune to this town? The only thing that brought misfortune to this town was the mine closing, Ida May said. And last time I checked, being vegan or waiting tables doesn't make tentacles shoot out of a cake. I would argue that's exactly the kind of behavior that would set a demon upon us. Half these people don't even go to church on Sunday, Virginia said. My entry was made with upstanding moral hands, and that is why it's untouched. That trophy and blue ribbon are rightfully mine. How did you do it? Ida May shook Virginia. How? Virginia clutched her straw purse tight as she held to her moral superiority and tight as she zipped her lips. But her eyes flitted to the back of the room just for a second. It was subtle, but Ida May caught it. The mystical Madeline, Happy Hollow's two-bit psychic medium, said in Latin, in the last row of folding chairs. Ida May didn't know how she'd missed her. Mystical Madeline's teal eyeshadow, pink bouffant, and the rainbow-sequined caftan she wore over her round body were so bright, astronauts could probably see her from the space station on a clear day. But it didn't make sense. Virginia would never publicly associate with someone like Mystical Madeline, a former star of Blue Movies who had married a low-level mobster. He was later found dead at the bottom of Sunday Creek, wearing cement leg warmers. That's when Madeline was suddenly struck with the gift, hung a shingle, and went into business as the town's only psychic medium. She had channeled dead relatives and lucky numbers since 1978, until dementia took hold of her mind. Lately, she had taken to circling the town fountain in various states of undress, talking to ghosts and ducks only she could see. I will get to the bottom of this, Virginia. Ida May armed herself with her dessert fork, turned and stepped into the melee. Snapping tentacles, biting cherries, and spiked tails bore down on all the contestants. All the contestants except Virginia. None of the monsters went anywhere near her. It's like there was an invisible shield around Table 5, keeping them away. Ida May grew more determined. 
Virginia had gone too far. No baking prize was worth this. Not even if the winner did get to be the honorary queen of the annual 4th of July parade and sole rider on the charity lady's cake-shaped float. So she stepped out of the protective halo, dodged flying tentacles, and smacked back the spikes of Ginger's devil's food cake, which swung through the air, attached to the end of a long, slimy tail. Ida May stomped off the stage and over to the back row of chairs. Ms. Madeline? A word. Mystical Madeline was absolutely delighted. She clapped her fat fingers, dripping in faux gold and rhinestones, in sheer joy. Isn't it wonderful? It really is amazing when a film comes together on such short notice. Such action and the special effects, so realistic. She applauded as the cherries rolled off the bloody remains of Norma's body and descended on Ginger and Clara. The actors, their reactions, so authentic. Bravo! I admit I was skeptical when I saw the script, but it's exceeded my expectations. Script? Ida May had to figure this out fast. Do you still have it? May I see it? Of course, I have it right here. Mystical Madeline fished an old piece of paper out of her beaded handbag and handed it to Ida May. She tapped the corner. Cultus number two, see? The director said I was perfect for the part. I filmed my scene this morning in a cellar under this very room. Such excellent set decorating. The candles and the symbols on the floor were very convincing. Very spooky. Mystical Madeline's script was a page ripped out of an old book. Parts of it were written in some ancient language Ida May didn't recognize. Only the heading at the top was in English. It read, Incantations to release the dark god who sleeps underneath to cleanse the world of the unworthy. There was a stamp on the bottom corner. Private Library of Orville Witherby Davis. That horrible woman, Ida May snarled. Orville was Virginia's father, former manager of the Sunny Creek Mine. He had been an imposing, unpleasant man, and nothing good had ever happened to those who dared to cross him. And now Ida May knew why. He had summoned help, evil help, to get his way. And it seemed Virginia had inherited more than a stubborn will and a wide bottom from her beloved late father. She had given swearing on her daddy's grave a whole new meaning. Ida May had to put an end to this nonsense right now. But as soon as she turned to the stage, all the breath went out of her. The eye, the halo of unfurling tentacles, the tail, they were all part of one beast. It had broken free of the desserts, as if they were merely the door between here and some unspeakable dark dimension. The hulking thing was nearly as tall as the ceiling, and growing bigger by the second. Edna cowered behind the folding chairs. Gloria had plugged in the curling iron and used the hot coil to burn the tentacles away from the door so they could escape. It didn't do much good. The whole wall was covered. When Gloria burned one away, another slivered in to cover the spot. Ginger bravely poked the creature's one giant eye with a spatula, trying to plunge it in to blind the thing. Clara whirled in circles, screaming, 
trying to beat back a whole pie full of cherries, which had grown to the size of golden retrievers. They were looking for their next meal, now that they had chewed Norma down to a pile of blood and bone. Only thing I'd change, M- Mystical Madeline said, still thinking this was a movie. Cultist number one's shoes were all wrong. What kind of cult leader wears pink satin shoes? Ida May knew. She stomped up to Virginia, who stood looking smug by her table, deigning to help her fellow contestants escape the monstrous jaws of certain death. Deigning in her pink satin shoes, which perfectly matched her pink suit, You stop this nonsense right now, Virginia. No trophy is worth this. Send the beast back. I don't know what you're talking about. Virginia looked away, clutching her purse like it was a life preserver. Cut the crap. Ida May, language. The jig is up. I know it was you. I know what you did. I saw the page from your daddy's book. There were rumors that he was up to dangerous dealings. Got his riches making a deal with a devil. I didn't believe it. But it's true, isn't it? It's true! How dare you sully the name of such a fine, upstanding pillar of the community! He dedicated his life to keeping Happy Hollow a safe, prosperous community! He kept the bad elements in check, unlike our sorry excuse for a mayor. Virginia pointed up because Chester was hanging upside down from the ceiling, wrapped in tentacles, bleeding from all sorts of unsavory places. The beast wrung the vital juices out of him like he was a wet dish towel. Ida May tried hard to calm her racing mind. Only a clear head could end this, and locked eyes with Virginia. Just because someone is different from you doesn't mean they're a bad element. Why are you so upset, Ida May? It isn't coming for you. The way I see it, our friend here is just doing what polite society should have done a long time ago. Taking out the trash. If you're morally upstanding and of good breeding, you've got nothing to worry about. You don't get to decide who is good and what is right, Virginia. You don't get to decide who deserves to live or die. Make it stop now. Virginia pursed her lips and looked away, offended as a tentacle crunched one of the tables to bits, sending splinters flying through the air. Clara cowered where the table once stood. The beast grabbed her, opened its mouth, and stuffed her in. It gurgled and chomped, louder than her screams, as it crunched down on her bones. Ginger grabbed onto Clara's leg, trying to pull her out, As she bravely punched back tentacles and spikes with her fist, she screamed, Let her go, you horrible thing! It didn't. The beast was big, powerful, hungry. Its tentacles had nearly covered every wall, every door, every window. The building shook like it was about to break apart. Chunks of ceiling and wall fell to the floor. The town hall couldn't be able to contain it much longer. Ida May was running out of time. Do you have the rest of the book with you? Ida May grabbed Virginia's purse but couldn't pull it free. That woman had a fat arm and an iron grip. Give it to me. If you won't stop it, I will. They both yanked, hard as they could. The latch broke in the tussle, and the purse fell open. Inside were two neatly folded, embroidered handkerchiefs, the antique cheese knife Virginia paired with her charcuterie board at every chapter meeting, 
and an old book bound in strange leather with Virginia's signature rose-shaped bookmark hanging out of the middle. Ida May snatched the book. If there were words to bring the thing here, there had to be words to send it back. It was too late for Chester, for Clara, for Norma, but Ida May had to keep this disaster contained. She couldn't let the beast loose on Happy Hollow. Half the town was right outside these walls, innocently shopping at the bake sale. Let it go, Ida May. This is beyond you, Virginia grabbed at the book. Ida May held it out of reach. A blue ribbon isn't worth killing for. These are your neighbors. Don't remind me, Virginia said. These people have ruined this town. Daddy would be appalled. I'm glad he's not here to see how far we've fallen. God bless his soul. Today, it'll be set right. Not if I can help it. Ida May turned her back to Virginia and opened the book to the marked page. She didn't see anything about portals or doors or monster slaying, but she had to do something. So she picked the spot Virginia had underlined and read aloud, Oh, hear me, Thagasa! The beast stopped. It looked at Ida May. Yes, this was it. I am your mask. Spluck. Something cold and sharp sunk into the back of Ida May's neck. Ida May wanted to scream but couldn't. She couldn't speak. She couldn't breathe. All that came out was a wet gurgle. The room spun. She fell. Her cheek hit the floor. As she lay there gasping in vain for air, the only thing she could feel were Virginia's cheese knife in her throat and a warm liquid rolling down her neck. Blood. She watched helpless as it pooled around her. I can't let you do that, Ida May. Such a shame. In the end, I thought you'd see things my way, but I guess not. Virginia leaned down. She filched the book out of Ida May's dying fingers, then pulled the knife out of her neck and wiped it with her handkerchief. Goodness, I sure hope all this blood doesn't ruin the silver plating. This knife cuts a gruyere like nothing else. The last thing Ida May saw before the whole world went black forever was the monster, grown to the size of that tacky yellow inflatable gorilla at the car lot down by the interstate. It crashed through the wall of the town hall. It descended on the bake sale. The townspeople screamed. They ran from the fiery-eyed beast, a halo of tentacles grabbing, spiked tail swinging, attacking anyone who couldn't run fast enough. The cherries from Norma's pie, now five-foot red balls of hungry death, rolled along behind, feasting on the injured and dead. As the beast cut a path of carnage, through downtown, the 123rd annual Happy Hollow Charity Ladies Auxiliary Bake Off Fundraiser had come to an abrupt and tragic end, and so had Ida May. Virginia stepped over Ida May's lifeless body took the second delicate embroidered handkerchief out of her purse and wiped the plaster and blood off the first place ribbon and trophy. Well then, that's settled. She clipped the blue rosette ribbon to her lapel and tucked her daddy's book back into her purse. She turned to watch the beast as it slithered toward the fairgrounds, ripping up cars and popping people's heads off like soda bottle caps. She smiled when it ripped the sign right off June Snow's vegan bakery. Virginia would have loved to see the look on June's face when she saw that. 
but June was very much dead, which suited Virginia just fine. It's about time someone took out the trash around here. I should have done it years ago. Virginia smoothed herself out, picked up the trophy, and stepped through the rubble. I think I'll go home and make a nice cup of tea. What a lovely way to celebrate. A fresh new day indeed. The end. Thank you so much for listening. Well, that's the story, folks. I hope you enjoyed Bake Off as much as I enjoyed writing it. And thank you so much to my wonderful mom, VM Gay, for recording the audio for me. If you're new to my work, I do have more works in audio. I write the 24-7 Demon Mart series about a beer cave that is the gateway to hell. And those are available on Audible. So thank you so much for stopping by. Happy spooky season.